Saints fans and hoodats from all over the world. It's time for the Bayou Blitz. With your host, Bob Rose. Happy Tuesday to all New Orleans Saints fans, fans of the NFL, and fans of the Bayou Blitz. Uh, we thank you for welcoming us into your radio waves and your homes again on this Wednesday, Tuesday night. Uh, we move, move to a special night and special time tonight, uh, but we thank you for tuning in. And joining me, as always, is my friend and my Hall of Fame uh, broadcast partner, Mr. <laughs> Kyle Mosley. How are you tonight, Kyle? Doing well, my friend. How you doing? What's going on up there in your neck of the woods? Well, uh, I'm doing well. Family's doing great. Uh, we've got a, a couple overcast days in a row, which ticked me off. We all know how I how I like that 90 degree sun beating down on me, no cloud in the sky weather. Uh, <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> well, good man. I tell you, we uh, we're getting some mixed rains out here uh, in the in the Gulf Coast region. It's going to be some scattered showers here and there, as well as that's also going to bring some mosquitoes. <laughs> so it's going to be pretty interesting the next couple of days. Yeah, and the mosquitoes down there are the size they look like they can uh, they could grab my one year old son and haul him off into the sunset. Yeah, yeah, but you know what, man? I went down to Jamaica uh, for a wedding. The mosquitoes literally picked me up. I mean, these, these were some <laughs> huge mosquitoes. And, and the thing about them, Bob, they have no fear. You, you try, you know, mosquitoes down here. You shoo them away. They kind of ooh, buzz off. These mosquitoes, like, yeah, like really, man, yeah. Come on, come on, bro. you know, Rastaman. You know, you, do you want to like to take a hit first, or are you gonna try to hit me? <laughs> so <laughs> it was just one of those things. Man. Okay, well. <laughs> Mental note: I know I don't make a trip to Jamaica anytime soon. <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't do it, man. Uh, but you know, it's good people, yeah. good, good fun. We had a good time. Just uh, beware of the mosquitoes. Oh, fair enough. Uh, now, the family and I uh, we attempted uh, to trek out to Pittsburgh Steelers training camp, which is just up the road from where I currently live. Uh, we tried to to go there on Sunday and as luck would have it, literally as we pulled up and got out of the car and started walking towards the field, the clouds opened up and it oh. was, uh, it, it was a rainstorm that you could tell was going to chase the team inside. So, you know, unfortunately that's t- tis the season when the humidity builds and, uh, scattered thunderstorms will pop up here and there. Uh, but speaking of tis the season, we are just two days away from the first new Orleans saints preseason game. <sighs> Uh, when the Saints travel to Jacksonville on Thursday to face the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. Yeah, can you believe it? Saints football is back, baby, and we are going to face what could be a preview of Super Bowl in it's not hot Atlanta. It's those little uh, girly girl Atlanta in the origami stadium. <laughs> but um, it could be that, man. You just don't know. Um, the Jacksonville Jaguars, they are vying for a position to get uh, to be the representatives of the AFC, as well as the New Orleans Saints are vying for their own position to be the representatives of the NFC. So it's going to be a pretty entertaining, I would say, what, first quarter at least? <laughs> so <laughs> we, we'll see how well, everything else translates, uh, especially with a lot of rookies who are trying to, as well as uh, free agents trying to vie for the team. Yeah, and that's just it. Uh, you know, like you said, you know, we'll we'll see the starters for maybe a portion of the first quarter, if that. Uh, I don't look for a lot of a, a lot of the top end players on I, uh, on either side to get maybe any playing time at all, because uh, like we talked about on the show last week, it's not necessary. I mean, not for preseason game number one. You know what people like Drew Brees and Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas. Cam Jordan, et cetera, et cetera. You know what they're going to give. Uh, this is going to be about uh, movement along the depth chart with other players, uh, positional battles, and uh, rookies fighting like hell to make this team. 
uh, and you know, we're uh, we're going to play an interview a little bit later on um, uh, from Lyndon Stevens, one of those rookies uh, fighting hard to make this team. Uh, but that's that's the sort of thing that, uh, that I'm going to be paying attention to is uh, especially once those starters that do play once they have a seat. Uh, then I'm going to kind of, you know, kind of edge up to the edge of my own couch and start to pay attention to some of these positional battles that you and I are going to preview as the show goes on tonight. Definitely. You know, one other thing we're going to really pay attention to is how well this Saints defense, if what we've been seeing in practice is going to translate well against an opponent. So I really will be paying attention to that because, in, you know, in – Reality, you're never really concerned about the Saints' offense as much as you're concerned about the Saints' defense. But the defense, they made major leaps to be one of the better defenses in the NFL on last season, and I think they're going to continue that route. We've put in some pretty uh, keep guys like Demario Davis, and you know Cam Jordan is, of course, returning back to form. Uh, you know Bobby and those guys were. I think Deuce as well as Zach Streif on yesterday were just notating that after that uh, event that they had at Tulane Stadium, Cam Jordan was out running mm-hmm. everybody, running sprints up and down the field, <laughs> having a good time. And it's <laughs> great to see that type of uh, attitude that you have for from these guys. The swag is there, you know, so I'll grunk crunk guys whatever they're going to call them is it the the grunk gang or whatever hey i'm all with it let's go ahead and let's see how those guys put it to the jaguars in preseason on tomorrow yeah because i and i agree with you i i think i was a little kid the last time i was legitimately this excited about the new orleans saints defenses uh or defense excuse me they, don't get me wrong. They have had some pretty solid defense uh, at times since the Dome Patrol era, uh, and even in the Sean Payton era, 2006 and 2009 teams come to mind uh, where they were very opportunistic. Uh, they made plays when it counted uh, and everything like that. But even then, uh, I think that I would take where this defense was last year, uh, the pieces that they had into place when healthy, uh, I think that that you can, we could make a case for that being the best defense of you know certainly the Sean Payton era and maybe even uh, a decade or so before that, uh, and that was before they added Demario Davis and you know some of the other uh, some of the other youngsters that we'll talk about as the show goes on. And I think you and I have applauded and admired the defensive moves and the defensive progress that this team has made over the last year. Uh, like you said, Kyle, we know what the, uh, what Drew Brees and Sean Payton's offense is going to give to us. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, <laughs> how many points that they're going to put on the board uh, and exactly how many players are going to get involved while doing it. But they, we know that they're going to produce. Uh, but this defense looked at times last year like a, championship caliber defense before injuries started to take a toll down the stretch. And you would certainly think that they would have done nothing but get better. Right. And and that's the key there, man. First teamers, we pretty much know or have a good, good idea who will be the first teamers. Where's the depth, right? And I spoke on the depth last week. The depth is going to really – tell us where this team is as well because if you can get a second team guy or third team guy to fill in the gap for a week or two and be very serviceable in their performance you have good depth but if you have if your first team guy goes down and that other guy cannot just step in and just perform at let's say an average level you have a problem. So in, in years past, that's what happened to the Saints. We would have guys who would go down, and then the, the, the second or the third stringers were not as good, so they would call guys from the street to, to come in and dress the next week. Mm-hmm. You know, So um, let's see how these guys do on tomorrow. Uh, we've still got a few more weeks left in – training camp uh, before the start of the season. So the battles have just begun. That's how I look at it. 
Yeah, you're, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, and you know, before uh, before we queue up um, the the interview with Lyndon that we had earlier today, you know, when he touches upon some of those exact things that you just mentioned, uh, this past weekend, of course, was the uh, there's something stuck in my craw, so I, I have to get it out. Uh, this past weekend, of course, most NFL fans know, uh, was the Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. And congratulations to all of those NFL players uh, who donned the yellow jackets and had their bronze statues put in Canton uh, to be immortalized forever. Uh, but here's something that has bothered me for years, and I want to get, uh, get your thoughts on it, too. Uh, what Saints player, or if there's a couple players, uh, player or players, do you think has been grotesquely overlooked by the Hall of Fame committee uh, and, you know, not having not been put in Canton yet? Hmm. Stan Brock. Ooh, that's a good one. Stan Brock <laughs> really deserves some, some attention, man. And I'm kind of surprised that he hasn't really – garnered their attention even though he was a part of some some up and down teams but Stan Brock for sure in my opinion deserves that recognition that, that's a good one I actually hadn't thought of that um, and you know there's there's a handful of names that each of us could name off uh, you know that we think you know, maybe should uh, or perhaps will down the road uh, get Hall of Fame consideration uh, but the one guy that sticks out in my mind, uh, and, and you know, it's on it's on the anniversary of when our Ricky Jackson got inducted into the Hall of Fame, is his running mate on the other side, Pat Swilling. Swilling yeah. uh, to me, the fact that Pat Swilling is not in the Hall of Fame, and you know, most of the time, to my knowledge, isn't even mentioned as a potential Hall of Famer, uh, is is downright criminal in my opinion. Uh, and you know, we can make a case for you know Sam Mills. Uh, I think should be considered too. Uh, but Pat Swelling, you put up his sacks and his defensive performances uh, on on a sustained level. It wasn't just one or two seasons, uh, and he's right up there, uh, both statistically and performance wise, with many of the outside linebackers and pass rushers that are already in the Hall of Fame. Right. Uh, you know, we just had Jim Everett a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, when we asked, you know, Jim and picked his brain about what it was like playing against those Jim Mora Dome Patrol defenses as a quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams, the very first name that he mentioned, even before Ricky, was Pat Swilling. Uh, and when a quarterback of that acclaim, uh, you know, can, can hold such, such accolades for a linebacker, for any defensive player, that should tell you something. You, look, man, I'm just looking at his numbers, and – if you guys don't know, Pat Swilling in 1991 was the Defensive Player of the Year for the mm -hmm. National Football League. He led the league with 17 sacks. 17 sacks. And get this, he only has 60 tackles. <laughs> so, man, that that's just awesome. And in seven seasons with the Saints, he he garnered what seventy six point five sacks. Yeah, that's that's yep. a pretty good career to have, man. Uh, and that is Hall of Fame worthy. Um, but Bob, think about it, and and let's just be honest. When it comes down to the Hall of Fame. Sports writers look at the popularity vote, right? It's about yes. that's all it is. It's a popularity vote, and I think that's what Terrell Owens was a part of his pro, pro, protest. I'm not going to say all of it. A part of his protest <laughs> was the fact that the guys who have been making the decision about who's a Hall of Famer and who's not, most of those guys never put on pads, but they evaluate, critique, break down a person based upon how accessible they were, right? How, how, they, how friendly were they to the media? The, a lot of that mm -hmm. plays a, 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 a major part in how the evaluation process goes into the Hall of Fame. You know, and, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm just thinking, and I have to agree, 
what about what they did on the field? We, we're talking about the player, not the person. And in in the bylaws, it's, it clearly states the person, the player should be evaluated for his play. But you know, you think about in society, especially today's society, the moral issue comes into play, and um, then mm-hmm. the other extraneous. Uh, attributes of the person is evaluated what they've done in their life has been becomes a a part of question did they have any foundations or did they give to the community all that stuff also comes a part of the evaluation process so you know uh it's difficult you know pat swilling has done some good things i think pat also was um a part of the political scene in new orleans for a little bit you know recently so yeah. I, I don't know I, I think he deserves at least a look you're right he hasn't been mission so why not just a look well and yeah there are uh, there are some that believe that there is a legitimate media bias against the new orleans saints uh not only the current teams uh you know of recent vintage uh, but just the franchise in general. And I know, you know, you, you've been covering the Saints for years. Uh, I've been a fan of them for, for years and years uh, as well, uh, uh, and also covering them the last two years now. Uh, so I know that this might sound like sour grapes, uh, but in my opinion, there's a lot of merit to what you said about you know, the, the Hall of Fame committee's, uh, say, shall we call them, choices. Uh, and who they put in there and when they put them in. Uh, I think that it's a real, very real possibility, actually, because uh, we know we know Mr. Drew Brees is going to walk into the Hall of Fame on his first year of eligibility. There's, I think there's zero uh, humans on the face of the earth that would question that. Uh, but maybe at that point in time, that might open a little bit of the floodgates to, you know, where we might see a, a Pat Swilling or a Sam Brock or maybe a Sam Mills uh, get in on a veterans committee's vote down the line uh, because, you know, someone like Breeze is just such so huge in stature, not only in New Orleans, but throughout, you know, the NFL uh, and, you know, such a well-known name throughout the nation uh, that once, once he has his, his name and his bronze statue in there, that might very well open up a little bit of media consciousness towards the New Orleans Saints franchise in general. Good point. I'm a, I just need to say this because it's something that was surprising to me when I heard Peter King mention this. Years ago when they were evaluating the candidacy of Warren Moon, right? And I had the opportunity firsthand to see a lot of Warren's play here in Houston. And I knew some of the trials and tribulations he went through, the racism he went through as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also, I know some of the personal trials he went through with his wife and family and everything. Um, And I said this, said all that to say this. Peter King said something that was surprising to me. And I'm thinking Peter King, one of the best evaluators of sports, you know, as a writer, as a analyst, uh, as just, you know, someone I looked up to and cherished uh, to read Monday morning quarterback from time to time, you know? So Peter King said when John, uh, Mac, John, the the sports writer for the Houston Chronicle, when he went to uh, pre- McLean, yeah. McLean, when he went to present Warren Moon's candidacy, he said, "I was against Warren Moon until I heard J- John McLean," and I'm thinking, "You mean <laughs> to tell me all that Warren Moon did?" You didn't read or understand his stats beforehand, and you're a voter. You're not just any voter. You are a well-respected voter. So that goes to show me right. it's just like these um, 
popularity votes for who's number one in the nation, <laughs> you know? And I saw someone put uh, Ohio State got a, a vote. A- even after Meyer's situation came down, I'm thinking, really, guys? They c- you can't tell me that's the number one team. <laughs> you know, after losing uh, their, their head coach, they're going to go through some turmoil, you know? But anyway, I- I'm just saying all that to say this, guys. Uh, and fans, and I, I apologize for any rant, Bob. But <laughs> sports writers don't evaluate the New Orleans Saints fairly and accurately because they have no clue of some of the mm-hmm. players. And I've listened to the NFL Network even after a Sunday game when those Monday morning evaluators get on the air uh other than nate burleson he knows the game but those guys have no clue who actually went on in the game they just get the bylines you know and i think a lot of sports writers just get the bylines and then they make their evaluation and say oh well the saints must not have been good they didn't watch the game right I mean, just the other day, uh, John Hendricks put out. <laughs> he could, they could, they had Traquan Smith as running back slash wide yeah. receiver. Could be able to spell the difference between Mark Ingram's four game suspension. Really, <laughs> this kid's a wide receiver. So that, who, what producer in that in that uh, room? didn't know who Trey Kwan Smith was. So they don't know people. So a lot of times you see these analysts don't know people as well. That's why the local guys who cover on a day-to-day basis have a better feel. And that's why these national guys usually rely on the local guys for their information. Well, and as they should, because uh, that that report that you talked about uh, on the NFL Network the other day, I had seen a blurb on it, uh, and then, like you said, my editor at at Canal Street Chronicles, uh, John Hendricks, expounded on it uh, much more so, and it's... The the network should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, Everybody that works, works for it and, you know, is responsible. Look, I don't I don't have a problem with people making mistakes, but this is a mistake based out of complete carelessness and uh, apathy for your job. You're going to cover an NFL team, at least have a general idea of what you're talking about and do a little bit of research ahead of time. Uh, And and like I said, every single one of them should be ashamed. Uh, We're not judging them as people, of course not, uh, but as professionals. The professionals, that was just a pathetic showing uh, all the way around. It wasn't just the reporter in front of the camera, like you said, Kyle. It was, uh, you know, it was the producers uh, and everybody behind the scenes as well. Right. Uh, because there's a lot of people that go into doing the work to, just to put out a piece like they do. Right. And I'm, I'm just going to say this and leave it as it is, man. I said all of that to, to just make the people think. National guys have a lot going on, and I'm not taking away from Peter King, but it was surprising to me that you have finalists going to vote, and you have a lack of knowledge of the finalist contributions to the game. That's the problem. I have, and I'm just wondering if someone of his stature would not recognize a player's contribution, how many more would ignore the the on-field contribution because there's a lack of either popularity in the press or there's just ignorance, just plain ignorance altogether. That's you have to wonder, uh, and you know, I, only they can answer that question. Uh, we can only speculate, but uh, the numbers that we're speculating on, or in this case, lack of numbers, in my opinion, it backs up our claim. Um, but 
uh, that takes that's to take nothing away from any individual that's already in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and again, congratulations to every single one of them. Uh, but jumping from the past back to the present, uh, we are so very excited to see our New Orleans Saints take the field on Thursday. Um, and taking time out of his astonishingly uh, crazy busy schedule. Uh, Lyndon Stevens did kind of sit down with me uh, earlier this afternoon and take a few minutes of his time. Uh, are, are we ready for that? Yep. Let's go. Oh, great. Well, fans, uh, I'm joined tonight by Lyndon Stevens, quarterback of the New Orleans Saints. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight, Lyndon. No problem. Uh, so you guys are getting ready for your first preseason game, your preseason opener this Thursday at Jacksonville. I'd imagine by now you guys are uh, definitely chomping at the bit to hit somebody else, <laughs> somebody that's not wearing a New Orleans Saints uniform. For sure. Yes, we are. Uh, we've been, you know, it's, it's been long days, long hours. Um, we've been practicing pretty hard, going every day out the week. And we're pretty excited going going into the preseason and ready to get out there and fly around and make some plays. I, everything uh, everything that a lot of us has seen and and read from people who have been at camp is saying that uh, for the most part that the defense is winning the, the overall matchups uh, on a practice day by day. Is that kind of the way you guys feel too? Yes, I definitely feel just the way we prepare before we go out there and and how hard we, we practice on a daily basis. I, I feel like we've been winning. We, we've been competing on a high level all around, and we've been doing pretty well. Have your coaches given you much in the way of uh, lineup plans, or uh, do you have an idea you know, how many reps you might get on Thursday, or are they kind of going uh, just going to adjust on the fly? Yeah, they haven't really told me exactly. He's told me that I, I will get reps. You know, because they want to see what the younger guys can do. Mm-hmm. But I know for sure I'll definitely get special teams reps, and you know, that's one of the main main things that you have to do well on, especially for a rookie or, you know, any guy really trying to make a roster is special teams, is, 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 which is very important. But he hasn't really told me how many reps I'm going to get exactly. Um, even if they're limited, um, I know for sure that I'm going to try to take advantage of those reps that I get and make the best out of them. Yeah, no question about that. And, uh, and you and I have talked uh, before, too, on the show here about how important uh, playing a special team's role and really you know, that's that's the perfect opportunity uh, for you or anybody, like you said, anybody that wants to make the team to stand out uh, to the coaches by your, uh, by your hustle and your technique on special teams. Yes, for sure. Yeah, special teams is, is, is very important. They, they stress that every day. No matter who you are, it's only a 53-man roster. So special teams, is, is, especially for me, is, is is the way I'll get on the team. And that's something I, I really take serious in practice and practice. And I try to do it to the best of my ability. Where uh, Defensively, where are uh, Coach Dennis Allen and uh, Coach Glenn, Coach Aaron Glenn, where are they lining you up primarily? I've been at corner primarily. primarily just been learning the cornerback position especially on this level, just mastering cornerback. And, you know, on this level, is, um, you know, it could be challenging at times. And, you know, for the most part, you know, I'm playing both sides. I, I, so I feel like when they see I've, I've mastered everything at the corner position, I feel like they might try to move me to nickel and, and try to see what I can do. But for the most part, I've just been at corner and all the practices and, and during training camp. Has it been along the outside or slot, or are they mixing you up pretty well? Yeah, sometimes uh, I go in the slot. Sometimes you have to, you know, cover receivers in the slot, but mainly I've been outside. So I've just been trying to do that pretty well and and, and, and learn from there. So i got to ask you, I mean, despite the fact that the defense has stood out more often than not uh, uh, when the two units practice against each other, uh, Michael Thomas has got to be one of the hardest receivers in the league to guard. Tell me, when you when you get assigned 
uh, when you get assigned to go up across from Thomas, what's the one, uh, one or two things that are going through your mind as far as uh, in man-to-man coverage? What are you trying to take away first? One of the first things, he's really physical. He's a big body. So you definitely try to get hands on him and try to disrupt his route. And you have to be just as physical as he is, or, you know, you won't win. You won't win that battle. He's six, six, five. I believe he's almost 220 pounds. So when you go against a guy like that who's very crafty, he knows how to use his body, you definitely have to be ready and be ready to be physical to, to win that to win that one-on-one battle. Now, how about Traquan? Uh, Traquan Smith, he's a, he's a rookie just like yourself. Uh, you went up against him in college a little bit. Uh, you know, you playing for Cincinnati and he playing for Central Florida, and you, know, you more than held your own. Uh, how uh, – What's going through your mind when you when you draw him for a one on one assignment? What are you trying to take away there? He's very good. He's very athletic. He can jump fast. He has the speed. But just you know, especially with with a legend, I'm definitely trying to get hands and hands on. Him. He's very athletic receiver, like I said, good speed. So when you, when you go against a guy like that, you have to win on the line because with with, with Trey Cron with Trey Cron and, and, and guys. Like Mike, if you don't run on the line, it's very, it's very hard to stop them as they get in their route because they're too good for you to just let them just run without disrupting their route on the line. So, like I said with him, I just try to get hands on. and We go at it a lot. We, we compete against each other. We get each other better. <laughs> Now, I know when we talked during OTAs, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, what some of the biggest adjustments uh, that you had to make. Uh, but honestly, you were only a, a handful of practices in. Uh, now you guys got OTAs and mini camp out of the way, and you're you know, about a week and a half uh, into training camp. Uh, you, you and I have talked privately uh, more than a couple of times. And you know that you can match up physically with any of these guys. And uh, you just mentioned a couple of great receivers that play uh, on your own team that you get uh, you get sharp against. Other than physically, since you know that you match up, what's the biggest adjustment that you've had to make uh, from college to pro? And has anything really taken you by surprise? Really physically, I, I can keep up with, with the guys. I feel like I do pretty well with that. But I, I definitely would say just staying in your playbook, and really learning the game is different from college and understanding the, the entire defense and not just your position. And, and really, this is this is your job now. In college, you know, you had classes in football. You had other things to do, other obligations. But really, at this level, it was just football, football every day. So all your time is spent just football, nothing else. So really just learning how to be a pro. And, and understanding that this is my job and understanding the different steps that I have to take in order to be successful on this level is something that, that that's really um that's really the main difference that or adjustment that I'm going through right now. Now if you if we're gonna step you out of the body of Lyndon Stevens for a second and put you on the sideline as a coach or a scout, uh and and you are watching Rookie defensive back, rookie cornerback, Lyndon Stevens play out on the practice field. Uh, so, you know, do a little bit of scouting on yourself. What are a couple of the things that you feel like you're really excelling at? Uh, and contrastly, what are a couple of things that, uh, uh, that you think you need a little bit more work on? The things that I'm excelling at, I'm, 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 com- I'm competing against all the guys. I feel like I've, I've, been, I've learned pretty, pretty quickly. Um, when the coach gives me, um, Give me reps. I, I try to take advantage of those reps to the best of my ability. Um, I, I, I try to put in extra time, and um, that's one thing I've been doing on a daily basis: watching more film. Um, other, you know, areas that I want to work on is just when the balls in the air. I want to go get the ball. I want interceptions. We want more takeaways. Um, just the whole defense. Learn everybody's position. Learn different responsibilities. I just want to keep mentally just keep selling and keep learning. But that's one thing that, that I want to do, just becoming more knowledgeable about the game because it's, it's just a big difference from college to, to, to the NFL. Just one of the main things, just becoming more knowledgeable, learning as much as I can on a daily basis, uh, perfecting my technique, and just becoming more sound overall. 
are the coaches game planning for Jacksonville at all, uh, or is it is it pretty vanilla? Um, we, we'll we'll go over what we're going to do. We haven't really went over that quite yet, but um, when we meet, we'll, we'll have a better idea of what we do, what we're doing going into that to that game. Now, how about uh, how about Tampa? I mean, you, know, you guys open up against Tampa Bay you know, September 9th, uh, you know, regular season opener, uh, and you know we obviously know that there's a ton of things to work on through the preseason, both as individuals and each respective unit. Uh, but are the coaches putting in any kind of game plan, even like piece by piece, for Tampa yet? Yes, they have been putting in different game plans. Um, we're, we're learning, learning new things daily. Um, you know, we we add things in on, on different days, and you know, just we work on a different covers. We're, we're working on, you know, certain covers just one day. Like we, there's, there's there's you know certain covers that we'll work on and we'll watch film on later that night, and, and then the next day we'll add another. We're, we're, so mainly like from OTAs till now, we have really like been going over kind of the same stuff, just trying to get better at those same coverages and. And that's really one of the main things we've been doing is just trying to perfect what we've already been doing, and, and that's that's what we've been doing so far. Now I know uh, I know you're working out a lot in, uh, on special teams, and a lot of you guys are going to have your your best shot, like you said, to make the team as a special team you know, on the special teams unit. Uh, but one of the weaknesses that a lot of us see on you know on this Saints team, at least until someone stands uh, stands out. Is no nobody has really stepped up as kick returner yet. Uh, are right. you going to be given any reps at uh, at the return spot, either kickoff or punts? Well, they're pretty stacked back there. I haven't. I've I've tried to get some reps out to practice a couple times, but you know we have some we have some pretty good guys back there like Ted Ginn, Camara. So yeah, you know those guys guys like that have a position on lock. But I've just been trying to focus on what I'm where I'm at on special teams right now, and so I worry about that. Just trying to be the best at what I'm doing right now on kickoff return, punt return, punt. Just trying to work in work on that and 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 dominate those positions, the positions I'm at right now. Then I'll I'll try to worry about getting on other things. <laughs> now we know that you're in the mix. Uh, you're right in the middle of a mix for uh, a cornerback spot, a defensive back spot on this team. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you to scout anybody else, uh, you know, within your own position group. Uh, but I will jump back to wide receiver real quick, if that's okay. Uh, I mean, we all, obviously know, uh, you know, Thomas, uh, again, Trey Kahn, uh Cameron Meredith. You know, they have slots, I would think, pretty much sewn up. Uh, but a lot of us in the media are writing about speculating uh, who might step up and grab that fifth or sixth receiving spot. Uh, other than the four guys that we mentioned, what's the t- who is the toughest cover uh, that you've gone up against uh, remaining on the Saints roster at, at wide receiver? Ooh, um, I'm like, I, we have a rookie man, Keith Kirkwood. He's pretty good. He's uh, He's a pretty good. Good receiver, big body. I played against him. He went to Temple. He's a pretty, he's pretty good receiver, and I feel like he has a good chance. He's on special teams. He he, he works hard. He's been really doing his thing day in and day out. So that's a guy I really, um, a guy that I that gives me a challenge when I go against him. Uh, we have two guys that just came in. Um, I forget his exact name, but he just came in. I think from the Patriots. And uh, he's a he's a he's a ten year vet. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Michael Michael Floyd and uh, Brandon Michael Tate. Floyd and Brandon Tate. Uh, those guys are fast, physical, um, and they and they know what they're doing out there. So I, I would say you know between those three, um, you know it's gonna it'll be a battle. Um, like I said, we just got to keep competing. I look forward to to seeing what happens. You know with the receivers and with me. So we we've been competing day in and day out, but. Uh, you know, for the most part, you know, Keith, I'm I'm really cool, with Keith Kirkwood, and uh, we we go at it daily, and we've been we've been uh, making each other better. Well, good, good. I, that's exactly what the two of you guys are there for. Uh, and I know, you know, a lot of us are rooting for Keith. Tons of us are rooting for you. Uh, we can't wait to see you get out on that field on Thursday, uh, and you know, show show us uh, show us what you can do. Um, <laughs> make the Northern Mafia proud, right? I don't know. Right, for sure. <laughs> 
Well, uh, listen, Lyndon, I know you got to grab a bite to eat before uh, before you got a group of uh, uh, defensive and special teams meetings tonight. Uh, is there anything that I missed uh, that you want to throw in there for our fans? Um, I would say just keep keep watching. Uh, we're getting better daily. Um, we're competing. We're making the offense better. The offense is making us better. And we're going to continue to work hard and try to be the best team that we can be. And um, I appreciate appreciate you for letting me for letting me be on the show. Oh God, please! I mean, it's it's my pleasure. Uh, I know it's Kyle's pleasure too. Uh, our listeners love when you come on. Uh, you know, you become extremely popular here. Uh, like I said, we really can't wait to uh, can't wait to see you get out on the field, and you got a bunch of people rooting for you. Uh, but you know, Lyndon Stevens, I thank you very much for taking a couple minutes of your time, and uh, good luck on Thursday. Look forward to seeing you out there. I appreciate you. Thank you. Good interview, Bob. Well, and there you have it. I uh, want to thank uh, Lyndon again for taking uh, taking a few minutes out of you know what was an unbelievable what has been an unbelievable uh, busy schedule for him since the start of training camp. Uh, it's always great to have him on, and you know, he's he's one of a handful of guys that that we can't wait to see what he can really do uh, on the field when he gets gets there on Thursday. Yeah, and it's opportunity time. Every time a guy has the chance to get onto the field, they have to show what they're capable of, if they can be able to make an impact. Uh, you have guys like Lance Moore. You have guys like. Pierre Thomas, who took advantage of those opportunities. Willis Sneed as well, took advantage of those opportunities. So when he gets on the field, will we be able to see what Linden can do at cornerback? And, you know, the guy has the confidence. He has the will. He has the pedigree with his dad. So I, I'm encouraged, and I'm looking forward to see what he's capable of doing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you mentioned you mentioned his dad, Max Stevens. And uh, hello, Coach. If you're uh, if you're tuning in tonight, uh, we, we want to get you back on uh, again as soon as possible, too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he has he's he had such a tremendous upbringing. Uh, he's such a tremendous young man. You could tell he's mentally prepared uh, to be where he needs to be right now, uh, and he realizes the opportunity that he has. Uh, yeah, he, he certainly has the physical skill. It's just it's a matter of a perfect storm uh, when you're coming from a position of an undrafted free agent like he is. Uh, but fortunately, the Saints in particular have a history of giving guys a shot uh, if they're going to work hard and if they have the if they have the ability to succeed. Uh, so he's he's going to have his chance. I can't. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him embrace it. Yeah, me me as well. So it's going to be an exciting time Thursday night. Can't wait. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and what what are a couple of the other things that you're going to be looking for uh, that during, during the game on Thursday, Kyle? What sticks out? Uh, what sticks out in your interest? Yeah, it was kind of interesting. You talked to him about the possibility of returning a punt or a kickoff. Uh, the special teams is going to be what I'm going to look at and and take very special note on what's happening there um, from. The snap, the protection, how these guys are going to get acclimated to the new ways of handling the kickoff uh, as well. That's going to be something new to see. But who's going to be the guy to step up the next couple of weeks to really show they earned the right to be our punt returner or our kick returner, you know? And one other thing, man. Guys, we got a battle at uh, linebacker as well. You know, uh, A.J. Klein versus DeMario Davis versus <laughs> Robertson versus Monte Teo versus Anzalone. You, you know, it, it, this is great stuff, man. When you have that type of depth available and you're going to see who – if the cream is going to rise to the top, who's going to be that cream rising to the top, right? So, yeah, I'm going to look at how these guys are going to interact because 
to me, that linebacking core is going to be critical to the Saints' success in 2018. Yeah, it really is. Um, it wasn't very long ago uh, where where the team really didn't have the quality bodies to put even you know three or four guys out there uh, as high caliber NFL starters. And you know now now we're talking about potentially going five deep. Uh, you know, deeper than that, really, when you factor in Nate Stupar, uh, who has starting experience both inside and outside, has ex- excelled on special teams uh, and, and, and has been a successful spot starter in the past, too. Uh, so, yeah, a linebacking core is definitely something to look forward to, um, you know, not and, only in and, game one, but throughout the entire preseason. Yeah, and, and I apologize, Bob. Kakaha, man, this is yeah, this is like – Prove it or lose it for him as well, man. Um, everything I've heard, he hasn't been a problem in camp, but he nobody is really saying much about him in camp as well. So it's going to be uh, one of those things. Can our guy really make it? You know, coming back from those injuries last year, he was still – you could tell he wasn't 100%. You know, but I, I'm rooting for him. I'm rooting for a guy like that, you know? Oh, yeah, I, I like Kikaha. Um, you know, I, off the field, he certainly seems like a, a, a fine a fine person and a gentleman. Uh, and on the field, he, he does bring some skill. I've always liked his, uh, his burst around the edge as a pass rusher. Uh, he's a little bit uh, lightweight to hold up down after down in the running game, but he's a fighter. Uh, and you know the, those anybody that takes him on as a blocker, even in the running game, uh, they're going to have their hands full. Uh, so he, he definitely is someone that you root for. But I agree with you. Their move, you know, the the team's announcing uh, that they basically moved to Kikaha from uh, a more standard defensive end position uh, to an outside linebacker. You got to believe that a uh, it would be nothing more as a situational pass rusher because I can't see him really capable of dropping into pass coverage on a consistent basis. And B, this is got, you got to believe that this is his last shot uh, to make the roster, at least as a New Orleans Saint. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have these other guys like you mentioned, Stupar, that's right behind him. But you know, Stupar can do well on special teams, as you know. So, man. <sighs> Another one of my favorites from last year, uh, especially in preseason, and he led the league in sacks in preseason, was Muhammad. Yeah, Al Kadim mm-hmm. Muhammad, man. Uh, so, are we going to get an opportunity to see him prove his uh, possible value of making the squad? Uh, he, right now, on the depth chart, he's behind Okafor as well as Davenport, of course. You know, the former. Uh, or our number one draft choice who has an ailment. We still don't know what's going on with him. He hasn't seen the field for a while. Have you heard anything new there? Uh, well, what uh, what we're hearing mostly, and I believe the team actually officially announced it either late yesterday or early today, uh, Davenport has is, is already been ruled out for Thursday's game. Uh, but injury-wise, it, it's what they describe as a, as a soft uh, soft tissue or a soft muscle injury, uh, which is something that you do have to be careful of because if you do rush yourself back on the field a little bit too quickly, it can become a long-term problem. Uh, so you you think, or at least your fingers are crossed, that they are being more cautious with him than anything else. Uh, but well, in a wow, way, I that think look- that that could be a good thing for the position group. Is that like uh, a, yeah, a muscle pull, he, or is that? I'm a, sorry. Go ahead. Is it a muscle pull, or is it a bruise? I mean, when you think about soft tissue. Is it something a tear, or, or what could it be? Uh, I think it's a pull. Uh, but again, you know, you know, especially Sean Payton, as most NFL coaches, they be as they try to be as vague as they can uh, with injuries, especially this time of year when you don't necessarily have to announce them. Uh, so yeah, it, a lot of the things that I'm reading is just you know just some, a, a soft tissue injury, nothing like a muscle tear. He has been out in warm-ups on a number of practices and you know stretching on the sideline and things like that. Uh, so you have to take that as a good sign that at least he's not too far away. 
Uh, and at this point, even with the number one draft choice uh, that a lot of people have high expectations for, I would rather the team be more cautious. I don't need Davenport on the, you know, pushing himself to be on the field in week one or two of the preseason. I need him to be his best by midseason and down the stretch of a playoff run. Good, good point, especially – we're going to need him to spell Okafor from time to time as well. Think about this because Okafor full-time is not the best thing with that serious Achilles injury that he had. And I know he's coming back from it and he's done an amazing job coming back from it. Right. Um, I read, I believe it was uh, an article on NOLA.com where he told was was told by his doctor that once you tear it, you won't tear it again. I was like, wow, that's astounding to uh, <laughs> to hear. I mean, uh, I'm trying to get some of those ligaments that that doctor put into him. So, but uh, yeah, right. I want yeah. to I want to speak to the guy that did my shoulder and did my knee. <laughs> <laughs> Look, my knees as well, man. So. um Interesting. Interesting to see what's going to happen with Davenport. I think they're going to need him throughout the season anyway uh, to be that complimentary type of guy in the rotation on that right side. So that's why also it's key to say who's going to be that other guy. Will it be uh, a, a Muhammad or Jenkins or would it be that what's the other young man on the uh, uh, George Johnson? You know, uh, you know mm-hmm. Mitchell Lowen and those guys too are vying for a spot. So, man, we got some good depth. I, I like what I see. I really yeah. do like what I see. Yeah, the coaching staff is going to make some tough to say. Going to have to make some tough decisions uh, at a couple points of this preseason. Uh, but again, you know, with Davenport out. And it wouldn't be surprising if Okafor uh, saw little to no action because they're, you know, they're not rushing him along very quickly either. Uh, so that's going to give Muhammad, uh, Jenkins, Lowen, Hendrickson, George Johnson, that's going to give them a chance uh, to really step out and uh, hopefully show what they can do. Uh, and what, what's the player's major responsibility at this point, uh, at this point of their livelihood, really? Uh, is to make the coach's decision tough. And that's what they tell every single athlete from the time, you know, you're in middle school and you start playing sports where, you know, where they do potentially have cuts. Uh, the only thing that's in your power is make it tough on the coaches to get rid of you. Uh, and that's right. what these guys are going to have the opportunity to do. Right, exactly. Good things, good, good position to be in. That's how you know you have a good team that's going to be able to compete week after week in the National Football League. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, we're, we've we focused sort of on the defensive end tonight, uh, you know, with some of the players, uh, you know, like Lyndon Stevens, uh, the interview earlier, and, you know, a handful of the other guys, uh, like you know, Natrell Jamerson, Cameron Moore. Uh, you know, those guys are going to have an opportunity to move up the depth chart and perhaps grab a spot from perhaps uh, from maybe more established veterans. We haven't even talked on the offensive side yet. Uh, you know, we mentioned, you know, wide receiver a little bit, you know, that, that fierce battle for the fifth and, or, or perhaps sixth spot. Uh, but we need a running back. This team needs a running back to step up too uh, because obviously, as we've mentioned numerous times, Saints are going to be without Mark Ingram for those first four weeks. And, yes, Alvin Kamara, one of the best offensive weapons in the league, is going to be there, and he could probably handle the workload. But you still need a quality number two back. Regardless of how Sean Payton decides to use him, whether it's a platoon situation or whether it's just to spell Kamara, you need to have confidence that you, uh, that you can sit Alvin for a couple of plays and you know, have a quality number two back that's going to get you tough yards in tough situations. And you know, nobody, the other running backs on the same roster are not real experienced at doing that. Well, you got Shane Vereen, you have Terrence West, mm-hmm. but right now, from the depth chart that was released two days ago, Vereen is ahead of West. Even uh, Jonathan Williams and Trey Edmonds is ahead of West. That's the surprising thing to me because everybody 
with his signing, thought Wes was probably the heir apparent <laughs> for at least four games, right, uh, to be the one <laughs> taking over for Mark Ingram. But, man, if you see the performance, Shane Vereen, I know he had, what, a touchdown, a couple of touchdowns in practice or what have you. Uh, he's showing his understanding of the scheme. Uh, and he was like that little scat back uh, kind of guy. But where's the power guy? And I know that's what you're talking about. What's the concern there? If we need that heart run that that pounding uh type of presence at uh in, in the middle of the, the 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 game where we need to grind it out who's going to be the guy to step up is it going to be williams is it going to be uh edmonds vereen has never been that type of guy west has been that type of guy to a certain extent in his career but who is going to be that guy yeah, and they're all going to get an opportunity. Uh, like you said, you know, Terrence West and Shane Vereen, they've done it before. Uh, Shane Vereen is a little bit more closer to the Sean Payton uh, type of prototypical back. Uh, very versatile, can be a third down threat, uh, you know, stay, can, does stay on the field in passing downs uh, to provide not only a receiving threat, uh, but quality uh, blitz pickup too. Uh, and that's that's the nuances that these younger guys are going to ha have to show that they can do. Uh, you know, the Jonathan Williams and the Boston Scotts, uh, the rookie six round pick, and even Trey Edmonds, who was on the roster last year, but uh, gathered a total of nine carries offensively. He was mainly kept around for special teams. Uh, so I am interested to see what those three guys can do. You know, we've seen Wes, we've seen Vereen do it before. And I still think that, you know, that, Coach Payton just brought them in as veteran insurance just in case none of these younger guys can step up and at least instill confidence in the coaching staff. Yeah. But, Bob, let's be honest. <laughs> we also know <laughs> our coach. If none of those guys on Thursday night show <coughs> anything to have him to be confident they can spell Mark Ingram, we are going to do what? They're going to make a move. They're going to make a move. There, there are guys out there that will be released also, and there are going to be some roster spots uh, that uh, <laughs> need to be taken up by other players. So, so somebody is going to be ready to either make a deal or we're going to get somebody from <laughs> from the street, man. And uh, – Again, whenever you get the ball, it's going to be your opportunity, Wes, Williams, Edmonds, and whomever else, to be able to make an impression on Sean Payton as well as uh, the rest of the coaching staff. But let me ask you this, man. I heard a lot of things uh, that's been going on uh, with the tight end situation. Uh, I'm looking at and listening to, and I've been reading some great content from you, uh, as well as Barry and uh, uh, the rest of your guys over at Canal Street Chronicles, looks like this kid, Dan Arnold, at tight end is really making a move. But can he really make enough of a move to get over Yelder, uh, Who Man, and the rest of those guys? What's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think it's possible. Uh, remember, Arnold really wasn't even moved too tight end until towards the end of OTAs. I mean, that, yeah, he, he was taking some reps there, uh, but he was mainly still listed as a wide receiver, uh, I, I, even though everybody pretty much knew that the move was coming. And he has been impressive, uh, you know, for his lack of time at the position. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the depth chart that the team officially released the other day, and, <laughs> let, you know, let's face facts, folks, that that first depth chart need, means absolutely nothing. Exactly. Uh, you know, for, <laughs> they they put it out there because they have a game coming up, right? Uh, and you know that's that's it. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, if you are going to take any stock into it, Arnold was listed ahead of Yelder on the depth chart, and you know, some of us have heard some mumblings that he's he's moved ahead of uh, of Dion Yelder in kind of the coach's favor too. Uh, now again, this is still early; they haven't played even a down of, of preseason football yet. Uh, you know, so Arnold still has a lot to prove, as does Yelder, and neither guy has ever taken a professional football snap at tight end before. 
uh, and they have some established guys uh, that they're going to have to displace from the roster if they're going to ha- uh, if they're going to make this team. Yeah, and, and think about this, man. If you are a tight end, and one of the reasons why it's been mentioned in Saints folklore <laughs> that Jimmy Graham is no <laughs> longer with us is that he didn't have that uh, propensity to be willing to block, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. Um, Yelder, small school guy, didn't really have to do much blocking. You know, uh, Dan Arnold, he hasn't really excelled at blocking, but he has excelled at finding the open spot, being a big enough target for Breeze or whomever else. That's going to be the key, man. And I, and I hear what people are saying. Uh, I know they brought in Josh F- uh, Phillips back at tight end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, man, if you are able to prove that you can find and become a target for number nine, you have every chance in the book. And that's what's really making him a, uh, I guess people say a dark horse to be able to make the team. I think that darkness is coming to light, and we shall see if it can be able to light up a little bit more in Jacksonville under those bright lights there in Florida. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, Arnold, along with the rest of these young players, uh, are, are going to have every opportunity. And you kind of, you touched on it last week too when you mentioned that you know you really don't see a lot of the starters or the regulars until week three of the preseason. So really, you know, you ha- these uh, many of these guys they'll have their reps this week. Uh, many of them will have a good number of reps in next week's game too. Two weeks, less than two weeks, really, is your only opportunity to shine on the regular units. Now, you'll still have a chance on special teams and practice, obviously. Uh, but as far as game situations, you have just two opportunities. Uh, no pressure, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, that's what the NFL is about. It, this is a professional league, and if you want to be a pro, you've got to be willing to compete. And you heard that in – the interview with Lyndon, uh, and, and it's going to be a common theme, and it's going to be every man for himself, to be honest, you know, uh, especially if you are not really sure your status with the New Orleans Saints. So if you want to have a chance to, to make a uh, an impact, this is your time to do it. And one, one other guy I've got to be able to mention, man, it's kind of disappointing to me because I thought he was going to be – that guard of the future for the New Orleans Saints. Landon Turner. Will we see Landon Turner make an impact? I he he regressed badly from his rookie season to last year. Uh yeah, we've talked about that before. Uh I've not heard much of anything from him uh thus far this camp so far. Uh, so I will be offering uh, offensive line is another position of you know to take deep interest in uh, Saints fans because Landon Turner is in, in the fight for his life uh, to make this to make this roster because the team remember they drafted Rick Leonard in the I think it was the fourth round uh, they drafted Will Clapp they already have Cameron Tom and Josh Laribus. Uh, Tom and Laribus are, are going to be tough to move move off of the roster because uh, the coaching staff has been high on their performance. And they brought back veteran German Jer- Bushrod, who knows the system, uh, yeah, has seen the ba- has seen the NFL battles and wars time and time again. Uh, yeah, so the Saints have already maybe one of the well, definitely one of the top five offensive lines in the NFL. Uh, but the the list of talent that, that uh, we just ran down, Landon Turner, again, is going to be in the fight for his life. Uh, so that's yet another reason to, to pay close attention uh, to what's going on in the game as you, know, you get late into the third quarter and fourth quarter on Thursday because that's when the Landon Turners are going to be on the field. And you want to see because if they blow too many missed assignments, you have a thirty-nine, uh, a thirty-nine-year-old Hall of Fame quarterback that's going to be standing back in the pocket when the games start to count. You can't be blowing those assignments. You're going to be out on the street really quick. 
Yeah, definitely. And we can only kind of imagine the turmoil that's going on with a lot of these guys who are not yet bubble guys, but you will start to have those bubble questions coming up after this game, right? So uh, I, I guess – we can call it who has bubble guts next next week. That that would be a good segment. <laughs> who who did we notice have some bubble guts to them uh, coming out of the first uh, preseason game, man? And look, I'm going to have a chance to see these guys on Saturday at practice uh, after the Jags game. I'll be down in New Orleans uh, firsthand uh, with Barry covering the New Orleans Saints, and so it's going to be pretty exciting for me. Um, to be able to do that. I usually get a chance to cover them when they come to Houston, uh, but this is my first time in a long time being able to do it in New Orleans. So I'll see firsthand, Bob, and, um, you know, I'm excited right now. Um, And I know a lot of uh, people need to kind of follow us and read on what's going on with the team. How can the people follow you every week? Uh, well, um, I can, uh, I can be followed on both Twitter and Facebook. Uh, my Facebook is Bob Rose. Uh, my Twitter is at Bobby R 2613. Um, my articles do run through the Canal Street Chronicles and Canal Street Chronicles can be found on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, the Twitter handle for them is at Saints CSC and, uh, my next piece is going to be a lot of what we talked about tonight. Uh, you know, kind of things that you, you know, that the that the fans may want to keep an extra eye on. You know, position groups or individual battles. Uh, you know, during the Jaguars game on Thursday, uh, we all know that we love to see Drew Brees, Michael Thomas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that's not what that's not what we should be watching in these first two preseason games. We should be watching some of these other battles that we have highlighted tonight, uh, because that's going that's going to make up the depth the depth of your 2018 New Orleans Saints. Uh, but in addition to both Facebook and Twitter, um, you know, uh, Kyle, I know you're helping me along with this and it's much appreciated. Uh, we started a Bayou Blitz page yeah, yeah. and Bayou Blitz group on Facebook. Uh, so please, if you're not already a member, uh, but you enjoy, enjoy our show and what we do, or you know someone who will enjoy uh, what we do, uh, please, you send either Kyle or myself a message or an, uh, an invite request, and we would be happy uh, to get you in the group. It's the best way you can reach out to either one of us and let us know about your input and everything like that. Because believe me, and we've said it before, uh, this is your show as much as it is ours. We want to hear your thoughts and suggestions. Yeah, and definitely, fans, I'm putting it out as a challenge on next week when we have the show on next Wednesday. Call us. We want to take some time out to hear your thoughts about the first preseason game. What's your thoughts about the Saints going ahead and just engage with us every bit that you can. Uh, You can always check me out at whodat at saintsnews.net. So whodat at saintsnews.net is the email. You can check me out on Twitter at saintsnews uh, as well as on Facebook at saintsnews as well. We respond if it's not going to be me it's going to be barry and as well as it's going to be bob so check us out so Mm -hmm. we'll be able to get you in the fold yes absolutely and you know i i second you kyle 100 percent uh you know i mean we've we've asked uh and you know we have gotten some good responses sort of behind the scenes on on social media uh same fans make yourself heard uh, you know, we, you know, if you want to call in and talk to us, uh, Kyle puts out the number, the call in number for you almost every week. Uh, we want, we want you involved. Uh, if you'd rather just get involved on, uh, on any of the pages that we just listed, uh, again, by all means do that. We want to hear your suggestions. We want to hear your views. Uh, you know, this is, this is your show as much as it is ours. And we say it every week and we truly mean it. Yeah, definitely. And, guys, if you had not heard our buddies uh, and these guys should be on the air right now under the dome with Sean and Alan, go ahead and check those guys out on YouTube. It's under the dome. Yes, absolutely. We do thank every single one 
ton of you for tuning us in on our uh, on our special Tuesday night. Uh, we will be moving back to our regular bat time and regular bat channel <laughs> on uh, next next Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time, uh, 8 Central. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed what we put out here for you tonight. Uh, we want to wish good luck to Lyndon Stevens and all of our New Orleans Saints on Thursday. Good luck and good health. And yes. uh, flip yourself over to uh, to Under the Dome. they got some great stuff in store for you, too. Yeah, exactly. And don't forget, check us out at www.saintsnewsnetwork.com. And you can check Bob at the canalstreetchronicles.com, where he brings some great heat on the New Orleans Saints. This is Kyle T. Mosley of Saints News Radio with my buddy and my friend, Mr. Bob Rose. Bob, kiss that little one for me, give him a hug, and tell Lauren I say hello. Will do. You stay well. I will talk to you and everybody else soon. Okay, buddy. Have a good one. And Saints fans, you guys have a good one, too. Take care.